Egypt is magic. I mean, apart from the scientific research, and I have been in this field for the last 32 years, and I have led tours for thousands and thousands of people from all over the world. Every single one of them, their heart and their soul have been enhanced and have been touched by the spirit of Egypt. Welcome to my virtual campfire. I'm Crystal Kelly, and today I'm here with a very special person, Mohammed Anwar Aisa, better known as Mo. I had the divine pleasure of spending two weeks with him recently in Egypt. I wanted to share his insight and his energy with everybody to really capture the essence of Egypt is very difficult. And if you stick around to the end of this video, I have a little secret that I am going to be telling. I've always been really fascinated by Egyptology. From a young age, in the third grade, I actually taught the history lesson of ancient Egypt to my class. And then when I went to University of Washington, I studied art history. It wasn't my major, but it was something that I was very, very interested in. And the two areas of art history that I loved studying the most were indigenous art and Egyptian art. As technology shifts and our consciousness shifts, uh, we're, as, a, as humanity, going into new realms. I'd love to discuss the evolution of where Egyptology has started and, and where it's going in the future. I'm really excited to talk to Mo about this, but first, Mo, I'd love to hear what drives you, your passion for Egyptology, and start there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. I appreciate uh, having me. On this uh, podcast, I'm very, uh, you know, happy to be here with you, uh, and welcome for all your audience. Of course, uh, uh, I am Egyptian, uh, and I am an Egyptologist. I absolutely agree with you. It is a fascinating science and studies, uh, because uh, most of the history, all the history of all the other great civilizations, it's a history, which means something happened in the past. So when you study it, you already know that that's exactly what happened, and it's not going to change. But that's not the same case in Egyptology. Egyptology is something very different because they are always, always and often new discoveries. And the new discoveries come up with something new that we didn't know that gave us more evidence and more chances to explore and learn more about things we didn't know before. So one of my great professors, last professors in, in the school where I went for Egyptology department in my university in Cairo, so he told me, Muhammad, you need to understand that, that Egyptology, it's like medicine. It's like you're, study, you're studying in a school of medicine. Uh, there is always new things every day. It's not something that happened in the past and it's dead. It's a life science. So uh, a new discovery in the Valley of the Kings this month, the month before a new discovery in Saqqara. Uh, in 2018, we have uh, found at least three or four different discoveries in one month, April 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. Every year we have a lot of discoveries um, and uh, unearthing a new tomb or unearthing a new, uh, a new site. Uh, it's not just giving us a new uh, evidence and a new information, but it gave us a chance to understand more about the life of those ancient Egyptians because there is so much that we still do not know how things happen or how it was moved or how it was built. No one is 100% sure how the pyramids are completely, how exactly they are built. We have theories and we have evidence of things, but it's not 100% completed to know exactly how the pyramids were built. So this is what is very fascinating about Egyptology. As you know, I'm particularly interested in anything extraterrestrial, any extraterrestrial influence that we can chat about, I want to explore that. I'd love to hear your opinion about the alignment of, of the temples and Great Pyramid Complex. It aligns directly with Orion's belt, uh, the Pleiades, and that is uh, one star cluster that I'm very drawn to. And so I think naturally, I'm drawn to go there, um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear how and what you think about the alignment of, of the temples. A very powerful and strong theory because uh, first of all, of course, from my studies, I believe that ancient Egyptians were amazingly advanced in astronomy. They knew very well 
the star constellation. They knew very well the location of each star and they know their, their uh, celestial map very well. They knew the Northern Hemisphere and their cosmic, uh, all the planets, all the stars, they knew it very, very well because they have came out with amazing signs of the, and knowledge about distances between things and about uh, directions. They knew where, where is north exactly, and they know how to navigate at nighttime. Uh, so definitely, uh, I strongly believe that there might be uh, a connection between the positions of uh, the pyramids and the position of different monuments in Egypt and uh, the celestial stars and the sky, especially the way how it's positioned on the western side of the Nile and considering that the Nile is reflected on the sky as the Milky Way. And to the left of the Milky Way, there is the uh, constellation of the Orion that the belt of the Orion uh, are the same position of the three pyramids at Giza and such. So we all know the, the, the theory. So it is very interesting and it's, uh, uh, I, I read about it and I'm, I was very interested and fascinated about the thoughts of it. And again, I believe the, the ancient Egyptians were very, very advanced and everything for them was connected with the nature and with the, with the stars. Let me start by the definition of being an Egyptologist or what is Egyptology is for everybody to know. Egyptology is a science that uh, it's a science and discipline that is uh, concerning and regarding anything that has to do with the ancient Egyptian studies. So it is a study of uh, ancient Egyptian art, ancient Egyptian history, ancient Egyptian literature, ancient Egyptian religion. Uh, and that is a study that is starting from uh, the fifth millennia BC uh, until the fourth century AD, which is uh, believed to be the end of the era where the ancient Egyptian or ancient Egypt has started to end. And there is a whole new era that started after that, which is the Roman period and then Islamic and then Coptic. And the uh, Egyptologist is a person that is uh, following that discipline. And the discipline is very much uh, respected in many different universities and some universities like in North America, they consider it uh, under archaeology and some other European universities, they consider it under philosophy and under other sciences. But it is, it has its own science and it has its own discipline. Uh, and of course, uh, the evolution of it, uh, it, it is as ancient as, uh, as ancient Egypt itself. I mean, ancient Egyptians were the very first Egyptologists themselves because they are the one that they were concerning about the studies of their own uh, culture and history and religion. So it is uh, very interesting when we learn, for example, the great King Ramses II, he has so many sons. One of his sons, one of his children, uh, his name is Ka Imwasit. And uh, amazingly, we find this guy, Ka Imwasit, he's the fourth son of Ramses the Great who lived around the 12th century BC. He is a very first Egyptologist, believe it or not. He's a very first Egyptologist. Uh, just because we, we learned that he have went back uh, during his lifetime, he was so interested in the history and interested in the ancient uh, monuments. So he went back to the pyramids of Giza and the pyramids at Saqqara. They were built around 1500 years before Ramses II time. So this guy, Ka'im Wasit, went back and restored those monuments. And he put inscriptions and hieroglyphs on the monuments saying that I came here to, as a respect for the monuments of my ancestors, I came here to restore these monuments and to look after it and to make it, make it shine again. So that is, that is a very first Egyptologist in the history, wow. 12th century BC, yeah. So Mo, over the centuries, uh, how many restorations do you think have been done to the Great Pyramids? Over all the centuries, uh, the, the Great Pyramids and the, the area of the pyramids, because that was, that was an ancient city. It was what we call the Great Estate of the King. And the Great Estate means it was not just uh, a tomb, it was not just a cemetery but it was an estate. It, it was a place where they are 
thousands of people working on daily basis. They have their jobs, they have their salaries. They were purification priests. They were priests for restoration. They were priests for cleaning. They were people who have their offices and administration. So uh, from that standpoint, it was a great estate. So over many centuries, restoration happened uh, during the time of Ramses II. There are some restoration happened during the Roman period, third, fourth, fifth century uh, AD. Uh, there are some restoration happened during antiquity time. Uh, even the Arabs themselves, that uh, most of the people think that the Arabs didn't really do anything with Egyptology. Uh, there is uh, Abdul Latif al Baghdadi. Uh, who was one of the very famous Arabs during the 12th century AD. He have done a lot of uh, work uh, that has to do with the restoration of ancient Egyptian monuments. And then until, of course, uh, the antiquity time, 17th century, the European uh, introduction to the Egyptology, and then the modern Egyptology, the beginning of the modern Egyptology, started by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's expedition to Egypt in 1801, the time when the scientists that they came with him, uh, there are 200 French scientists, they came into Egypt with this expedition. They started their exploration to Egypt. And this exploration came out with something wonderful, which is about 40 volumes of a great encyclopedia. Uh, they call it uh, Description de l'Egypte was completed in 1829. So 20 years of studying the fauna, flora, uh, monuments of all, all over Egypt has been perfectly painted and drawn, have been perfectly studied with colors and put in these big, big volumes. And it reached to us until today. In between the ancient time and the modern Egyptology time, which is Napoleon Bonaparte, as I mentioned, uh, the famous uh, Herodotus uh, or Herodotus, uh, the famous Strabo, the famous uh, Manitho, all those uh, Greek priests, uh, or I would say Greek Egyptian priests, who lived in Egypt and visited Egypt between the 4th century BCE until uh, the 2nd century BCE. The, the Ptolemies, who were the Greeks, they were so much into Egypt, and they are the one that they were so much, they have enhanced the Egyptology uh, science because they have studied everything about ancient Egyptians, and they have uh, improved and developed a lot. So during this time, many so have written the Egyptian history, and they have he has classified the, the Egyptian history into uh, kingdoms that we call it the old, middle, and new kingdom. And then he has uh, subdivided these kingdoms into uh, dynasties that we have 30 dynasties from dynasty one until uh, the last dynasty before Alexander the Great conquering Egypt 330 BC. And uh, this is of course a great work of Egyptology as well. When you're in Egypt, you, it feels ancient. I mean, it really feels ancient. And one question that I have is how old? How old is everything there? I mean, it, does it go all the way back to Atlantis? Feel like the age of, of, of things, the Sphinx, the pyramids, a lot of them are, are a guess a little bit. I'm curious to hear from you, Mo, um, what you think about uh, the relationship to ancient lost cities. Just, I'll be very frank with you. I depend on mainly on scientific research and scientific as evidence. And we are using logic and logical evidences in our research studies. So for example, water erosion on the body of the Sphinx. That has been a debate between uh, a, a team that they are supporting that uh, this body of the Sphinx is more than 12,000 years old, uh, or it goes back to 12,000 BC, let's say. And uh, the other team, uh, that they follow the scientific research and evidence and they say no it is only about 2500 years uh, B B bce and that is the time of the of the pyramids so if you ask my personal opinion i will follow the second team which is uh, i believe that it belonged to the king uh, one of the kings who built the great pyramids maybe king kefren i believe uh, the builder of the second pyramid and the relationship between, or trying to make a relationship between ancient Egyptian civilization and lost Atlantis civilization and many other uh, things like that, if people come with an evidence, then it's good for them. I mean, I'm completely open-minded to, uh, to, to read and to respect uh, other people's theories. If they come out with a theory that I would be interested in reading, 
and believing in the evidence of it, I would be very happy. But unfortunately, from my readings until now, uh, we don't have an evidence, uh, a solid evidence in our hands uh, to connect the ancient Egyptian civilization with the lost Atlantis civilization. But I respect uh, if people believe in it, then it's what, what they believe they are correct, what they believe they are happy with. See, this is this is actually what I really love about having this discussion with you, Mo, is that I live in this like energetic sort of world and uh, and yours is more a scientific world. So it's, I love hearing the scientific approach. And I also know that um, what I felt, I know that when I was there, I mean, Egypt just had a different feeling than anywhere else I'd been in the world. Egypt just, it felt magical. It really had, um, it has its own unique essence to it. And I was very called to go there because of that essence. And so I know that there's, there are many, many people who feel called to go to Egypt and it sounds odd, but it felt like home um, in a lot of ways. It is very special. <laughs> And I 100% agree with you. Uh, Egypt is magic. I mean, apart from the scientific research and from the science of Egyptology, anyone who have visited Egypt with me, and I have been in this field for the last 32 years, and I have led tours for, I can say, thousands and thousands of people from all over the world. Uh, there is every single one of them, I can guarantee you that they have their heart and their soul have been enhanced and have been touched by the spirit of Egypt. And they have felt something very different. It's felt magic. They felt in love with this country. They felt in love with the history and the archeological sites. Don't ask me how, and don't ask me how it happened. Or what is, I don't know. I cannot even have an explanation of this magic and this love that everyone uh, comes to Egypt feel it. I, I have people who have visited Egypt at least 12 or 15 times with me on tours because first time they came, they fell in love with Egypt and its monuments and its people and its history. And they are still coming until today. Every year they, they say, we need to come back. Egypt changed people. I know people that their life have completely changed after their visit of Egypt. It taps into a quantum science. The Egyptology is so much more than just a, a regular science, in my opinion, uh, there's there's something that maybe perhaps our minds don't always make sense of, but in our hearts we feel it. And and when I was there, I really felt my heart expanding and into really really open realm. The only word I can really describe is quantum. It was a a quantum experience. I'm really interested to hear what you think of the purpose of the Great Pyramids. I know that um, a lot of people refer to them as tombs, but, uh, and like Valley of the Kings, that felt like a tomb. But the Great Pyramid, I got the feeling that they were vibrational energy centers, a very high frequency um, vortex. And so I'm just curious what you think as an Egyptologist, what the purpose of the Great Pyramids were. The pyramids were built to be a house of eternity because those people believed very much and they have a very strong belief in life after death. They wanted to make sure that their life uh, after they will be reincarnated again and or resurrected again will be safe and will be happy and will be eternal. So they wanted to preserve their bodies, uh, which they mummify. So they invented mummification. And because of this mummification, they were sure that their soul, uh, which lives in the body, as the body is a temple of soul, as we all know, when it comes back from its journey, that joining the sun god Ra in heaven, it will come back and recognize the body, and then uh, it will join uh, the body and it will be the resurrection will happen. So from that standpoint, that's how I believe that the pyramids in general were built to be uh, the house of eternity for uh, those pharaohs. Of course, some people believe that the pyramids were built to be uh, centers of energy or portals of uh, or antennas for uh, energy. Uh, I respect that as well. Uh, and if uh, the people want to believe that, that's, that's fine for me. Uh, because the way how they feel it, the people, they feel that. And I, I cannot 
judge someone's feeling because I'm not in their place. I'm not in their shoes. So it's what I feel is I what I feel, I know it. And what they feel, they know it. So uh, if they go into the pyramid or if they are by the pyramids and say that I feel a very special and powerful energy and I feel this is the way or the reason why the pyramids are built like that this is this is it, it, it is a way how they are, they believe in it so it's the right way for them uh, but for me i'm not sure or i don't have an evidence of whether these pyramids were built for any other reason or not i i don't have that uh, knowledge uh, you know i have the knowledge that i know uh, or that i study so of course mm -hmm. nobody knows everything so mo is there anything else that you want to share or to to say I, 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 of course, I want to thank you so much for uh, hosting me on this uh, uh, wonderful podcast. I want to thank all your audience for listening to us. And I want to say something. I want to say that uh, Egypt is a place where you will really feel different and you will feel yourself because when you come to visit Karnak Temple, uh, it's exactly like you're riding a time machine. And that's how every time I feel it, you know, I'm riding a time machine and a time machine is taking me back into history and it's taking me back into a very, very deep history. And uh, anyone who wants to study the history of the world, you need to come to Egypt because you will find everything in Egypt. You will find uh, ancient Egyptian pharaonic pharo pharo time. You will see Greek uh, time. You will see Roman period. You will see uh, Coptic and Christian. You will see Jewish. You will see Islamic uh, and you'll see modern, uh, even including the uh, European uh, art and architecture in downtown Cairo, which is built in the you know 19th century. Uh, you will find Art Nouveau and Art Deco and uh, and the beautiful art style. So uh, there is so much to see in Egypt. There is no way you can cover Egypt in one tour or two or three or even ten tours. Uh, you can come to Karnak and visit Karnak for the whole day and you will not cover one tenth of it. Uh, wow. And I have I have studied this for 30 years and every time I visit Karnak Temple, uh, I still see something new that I have not seen before. It is an encyclopedia of the world. It is the greatest open air museum in the world. It is the largest archaeological sites in the world, period. Uh, in the Valley of the Kings, in the Valley of the Queens, and the Western Bank of the Nile in Luxor. Uh, it is where all the amazing civilization that you can learn about religion, about art, about history, about medicine, about science and geometry and art and architecture and language and, and even poetry and uh, love letters and uh, uh, beautiful uh, literature and stories. Uh, uh, comes from ancient Egypt. So uh, from uh, my standpoint, I am uh, saying to everyone who is watching us, uh, think about it and uh, make the trip to Egypt and be sure we will welcome you and we will uh, take a very good care of you and you will see something that you have never seen before. Mo, I just want to I just want to tell you uh, thank you so much for doing this interview and for sharing your passion of Egypt with with everyone. It's it's really special and I know I promised everybody a little secret that I was going to tell at the end of my video. My secret is that the videos that I've been producing um, and that go through each temple. I've encoded uh, certain vibrations into those uh, videos and when you watch them you will um, just naturally pick up on the um, energies that were at each temple initiating yourself into the energies and so if you follow each of my videos along you will be essentially coming along the initiation process that that I went through so I'm just really excited to explain that to people and they all the videos are encoded with vibrational frequencies that will help raise your vibrations and hopefully inspire you to also visit Egypt one day um, I know I'll be back and uh... It is absolutely, I welcome everyone who is watching us. I thank them for their time and I can tell them thank you so much. Uh, and hopefully I will see everyone in Egypt again, which is uh, their home. Egypt is a home for everyone from all over the world. Thank you. Yeah.